The Bible says in Acts 18, verse 24 through 28, it says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately of the things of the Lord, though he only knew, or though he knew only, rather, the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had uh, believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Let's pray. Father, we pray tonight that you would speak to us. We pray that your word would go forth and that it would uh, empower us and equip, uh, equip us. Lord, I pray that we would walk in greater wisdom and greater grace and greater uh, just anointing as we go forward and lead as you have called us to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I have, I have an incredible wife and she uh, has taught me a lot of things. And I, and I might might be better for me to say that um, she's taught me how to do things better than I was originally doing them. I mean, have you ever you ever had someone do that? Like, um, I I have uh, been taught by my wife that when you make spaghetti, you don't break the the pasta. Have y'all did y'all know that? When I grew up, you were breaking pasta. I, matter of fact, there was a uh, video that someone has had an Italian husband and she was joking. So she was pulling a prank and she was going to break the pasta and he was like flipping out like, don't do it. I was like, that's you. And I sent it to her. But she's, t- <laughs> she's t- taught me how to better make spaghetti. She's also taught me how to better you know, uh, uh, communicate to kids, right? Before, you know, when I had li- our little kids or even any kids, somebody's little kid in church, you know, you just start talking at them. Hey, Pay attention, you know, and, and as guys want to do, sometimes we just get louder, right? But that doesn't necessarily work all the time or most of the time, right? So she taught me, you know, you get, you get down at their level and say, look at me, look at me. Before you say anything, you get their focus, you get their attention. And boy, you'd be amazed at how wonderful that works. That's a very powerful tool. I, I was getting attention, um, maybe not the right attention or good attention, and she taught me a better way to do that. You know, I'm having some issues here with my thing here, and that's not going to work out for me. So I want to talk to you tonight about leading a, in a better way or a more accurate way of life and godliness. There's, there's things that Jesus has taught us. There's things that he has provided for us. There are, there are uh, principles and there are guidelines and there are things that God wants us to understand God wants us to know. And in order for us to do that, uh, we, we have to grow in these things. We have to learn them. We have to learn them effectively. We have to, to actually uh, mature. That's what I'm trying to say tonight, is that we, we are not called to stay babies in the faith. God did not call you. God did not call me to remain spiritual babes, spiritual infants. God calls us to more. And as he calls us to more, he also invites us to a greater measure of leadership. In other words, we're supposed to influence other people. It's not just about us growing in our own self, but it's actually us with others growing God's way, growing God's way. And so what I want to talk to you tonight is about that, is about how we can advance, how we can can learn, how we can do things in a much more accurate, much more effective way. And what I believe that God wants to do to help us be better leaders because we're called to be leaders. We're called to have influence. We're called to make a difference in our community. We are called to be different in our job and different in our homes and different all around. The world needs to see Christians for who they really are, not for who we're not. And unfortunately, the way we've been taught may not be the most accurate way. And that's what I like about our text tonight is that though um, though uh, Apollos was accurate, he was taught a more accurate way. And I think there's a, there's a way that we can do things that's accurate, but then there's God's way, which is more accurate. Amen? So I think when we can learn the, the more accurate way of Jesus, his style of leadership, when we can, 
when we can really get a hold of the principles that he puts down, then we'll be more effective in, in not only in our ability to lead others, but actually help them, equip them, empower them so that they can flourish in life and fulfill their God, God giving pur- God-given purpose. Right, And that's really what the call of leadership is. It's to empower people instead of limit them. So many times we think of leadership and the models that we have and the pictures we have is that someone is sitting on top and somebody is kind of orchestrating and somebody is kind of dictating down and kind of making everyone, it's like almost like everyone around them exists to serve them. So we place limits because we don't want someone to exceed us, to excel us, right? I mean, how many of us have been on a job where you were more, uh, more skilled in a certain area than your supervisor was or your boss was, right? Like all the hands go up. Y'all weren't even shy about that. Neither. It was like, for me, for sure, right? You know, but, but they were in the position of leadership, so they didn't want your gifts to shine. Sometimes it felt like they were putting you in jobs that didn't let your gift shine, or they were even taking credit for your work. Got a lot of amens there. You know, leadership God's way is not about us having things better for ourselves. It's actually about helping other people have better lives. Look at what Jesus did in, uh, look at Jesus's way in John chapter 13. John 13, uh, verse 13 through 17, Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so am I, or so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent, he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you know these things, blessed are you in doing them. He says, he says, the one the one that is serving you is the greatest among you. And in our context, in our world, in the examples that we have around us, in most cases, it's the opposite way. In most cases, leaders treat people like they exist to serve them, to forward their call, their purpose, their mission. And while there is a partnership there, and while leaders are responsible for uh, direction and for for uh, movement towards the right things, true leaders operate differently than what we see in the world around us. And here's the thing, you guys, I'm going to treat you all tonight as though you're leaders, because you are. Uh, John Maxwell is famous for saying that leadership is influence, and every one of us have influence in some form or fashion, don't we? Now, you may not have the CEO influence, you might not be the one calling all the shots, but you probably have people around you and you probably have people beneath you and you probably even might have people above you that you influence because that's at its core what leadership is. It's influence. If if we're going to lead people well, uh, we're going to have to lead them differently. And here's the truth about the people that you and I lead. Uh, They're going to mess up. They're going to make mistakes. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you had somebody you were training and it was like they were doing, they couldn't do it as good as you and it was frustrating you because it's like if I did it, it would take me five seconds and it would be good and you're doing it and it's taken me an hour to explain it to you and it's not good. I mean, you ever felt that way? I know that might be extreme, but maybe not. You know, I mean, it's inevitable that the people you lead are not going to be where you are, Right? Generally, leaders are out in the head. Matter of fact, if, if another John Maxwellism is, if you if you're, say you're leading and no one is following you, you're just taking a walk. You're not a leader because people have to follow you. Amen? So there, there is a situation where you are in a position of authority or your position of leadership, and that person is not there yet. So they're going to not do it right. They're not going to do it the way you would do it. They're not going to do it well. And that's going to frustrate you, isn't it? That's going to challenge you, isn't it? That might even make you say, you know what? I'll just do it myself, and I, I don't, you just answer the phones or something, right? You just breathe over here, right? I mean, it's, that's kind of the attitude. You know, when I was in high school, I, I moved, um, oh, I think, what was it? My 10th grade year, probably, I was in, I was in chemistry class, and, and I moved from Georgia to Florida. And when I got to Florida, I, I, I you know, I was trying to take, comparable classes. And so I was, I think in AP chemistry. So 
I tried to take AP chemistry at the new school. And, and as soon as I went into the door, you know, they had the guidance counselor walking me around and introducing me to the classes. All the kids, I mean, all the kids were like, don't take this class. They were like, take another one. Don't take this one. And of course I was like, no, I'm smart. I can handle this. And I'm like, I'm going to take this class. Well, guess what? I found out that when I had moved, somehow Georgia was 16 chapters in the book behind. So I was way behind the class and I had a, let's just say, not excellent teacher. And I was not doing well. I was struggling. And so I went to the teacher and said, listen, I need help. And the teacher's like, that's not my job. Now I'm a teenager and in my mind, I'm like, no, but that's exactly your job. I was behind. I was struggling. I was hurting. You know, like, like me and my teacher, you might have had bad leadership. It might have been in a poor leadership environment or a poor leadership culture. And maybe you've seen that the default re response of those leaders is to, to be critical, to criticize you, or even just straight up cancel you. My teacher's just like, no, you just suck it up, figure it out. But that's it. I'm not taking anything you say. I'm not helping you. Don't come up. She told me, don't, don't come ask me anymore. <laughs> I mean, for real, that's probably why all the kids were like, don't come to this class. But I mean, have you ever been in a situation where a leader would criticize the people around them for not doing it, doing the job the way they wanted or not doing it well, or, or just, just essentially just say, don't deal with this person. Like tell other, you know, maybe, maybe it wasn't you. Let's hope it's not you. Maybe it's someone else on the team that they're canceling. And so they say, Hey, listen, just let so-and-so do their own thing. Because we don't take them serious anyways. I mean, yeah, they got a paycheck, but we're not, you know, we're not giving them any responsibility to give them anything. I mean, have you been, I mean, isn't that kind of normal? It's just instead of, instead of doing the easy or doing the right thing, instead of improving people or helping them learn a better way or teaching them how they should grow, they end up getting critiqued and they end up getting criticized and they end up getting canceled. But a good leader, a godly one does things very differently. One of my favorite leaders in history, and if you are interested at all in the topic of leadership, I highly recommend a book called Xenophon's Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great, you may remember from Isaiah chapter 45 as being God's anointed world ruler at the time. God anointed Cyrus. Matter of fact, God calls him my, my anointed one, almost the same word. Matter of fact, it is the same word, my Messiah, my anointed one to bring stability, to, to deliver my people. And Cyrus, we know, is the one that let the people go back to build the temple. And Cyrus actually supplied money and supplied all kinds of stuff to make sure that God would be glorified. But there's, there's some phenomenal principles. And he had the situation where he had this group of people that he had kind of brought into his army, made an allegiance with, called the Caducians. And he had set up a strategy and they were, I think, calling after the Assyrians at this time. And he had set up a strategy and said, okay, Caducians, your job is right here. And this is your mission. And I want you to do this specific thing. And I want you to assault this thing. When we send the signal flare or whatever we do, you do this. And the Caducians bailed. They, they bailed. And because they didn't keep the strategy and because they got afraid and because they thought they could do something differently, they actually took an L. They, they, they lost a lot of people. They, they, they suffered greatly. And then, um, of course, uh, Cyrus won. They won the battle. And so now the Caducians had to face Cyrus because they had failed their, their part. And as a result, people in Cyrus's army died. And so now they were terrified. They were, ter they were terrified. They were afraid. Because remember, Cyrus the Great eventually ruled the whole world, at, kind of the whole known world at that time. And so he was, a, he was a massive deal. He was a big deal. And, and I love what he said. His response to this situation, I'm going to read it. These are his words. And his response is so different than kings or emperors or generals of his day. And I want you to hear what he said. He said, at dawn, I sent out messengers to summon all my officers and the entire Caducian army, army to an assembly. The faces of the Caducians were clouded with foreboding since so many commanders in my place would have condemned them to harsh punishments. But listen to what he said. But I wanted to see these allies restored to self-confidence, not driven deeper into despair. When, what the Caducians needed, I knew, was to learn from their mistake and submit to greater discipline. 
He said, I will use the voice of reason, not the thunder of judgment. Man, that's good, isn't it? See, he could have, he could have punished them. He could have, he could have killed them. He could have made them an example. And what did he say? He said, I knew what they needed. They needed more discipline. They needed more encouragement. They needed not judgment. They needed reason. They needed to be stirred up and they needed to know that this was a mistake, but they'll get, they'll get grace. There's a chance to learn from this. There's a chance for, to grow from this. Now, I guarantee you, um, my understanding would be that if they, the next time failed, payday would come. But in this moment, what did he opt to do? He opt to teach them to speak to them and say, I ought to destroy you like you expect, but I'm not going to. Don't do this again. There's a reason why I had you positioned here. This was the plan. This was the strategy. And if you'd have executed this, you would not have suffered loss. What did he do? He actually won them over even more. He didn't rule them by fear. He didn't rule them by making them an example. He didn't rule them by by dominating them or being domineering over them or calling them out in public and just blasting them. He actually called them out in public and gave them grace. So it's really important that we see that it is possible that um, for us, even if an anointed Old Testament general can do it right, then we can do it right too. I think it's possible that the default mode to criticism and critique or even canceling someone is because that's the easier option. It's much harder to, uh, to stay and to teach and to invest in someone who's messed up. It's much harder to let go of a project and actually empower somebody to learn to do the project. It, it, it requires much more effort on the leader's part to lead people while they're immature and while they make mistakes and while they don't know any different. It's much more challenging. It's much more challenging to sit with a student and help them make up 14 chapters worth of content. That's difficult. Be much easier to just say, hey, whatever grade you get, you get. Sucks to be you, right? I mean, that's, it's difficult. You know, I know that Cyrus the Great was chosen by God. He was anointed by God and he was a good leader. But you know what? Jesus was a better one. God's way is a better way. It's a more accurate way. It's, it's very effective. And leadership Jesus' way is not about building ourselves. It's not about, you know, how can I exploit the people around me to make myself look better or to make my, my pockets fatter. It's not about building my brand. It's not about, you know, building my business. Leading Jesus's way is about serving others. It's about helping them become who they were created to be in, how, in the kingdom. Like it's, it's about helping them flourish as members of the kingdom of heaven. And guess what? Your business, your brand, your life is a part of the kingdom of God, or at least it should be. So if you help, people function in their gifts and function in the kingdom, guess what? It will bless you. It will build you. But if you prioritize you, you're doing it wrong. And so many of the examples around us, that's what the focus is. It's all about me. Apollos here in in Acts chapter 18 knew about Jesus. He knew, the scripture says, he knew the way of Jesus, the way of the Lord. Matter of fact, he knew what John preached, right? It says that he had, he had been baptized with the baptism of John. It doesn't say anything after that. So what did John know about Jesus? Jesus was the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Jesus, uh, uh, John preached that Jesus was coming. Remember, John's mission from God was what? To make the path straight, to prepare the way of the Lord. So how did he do that? He talked about repentance. He talked about getting your life right. He talked about being prepared because The day of judgment is coming. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he said, hey, it's Jesus who's come. He's the king. He's the Messiah. He's the one that was sent. So so Apollos knew those things. And it's likely Apollos really focused on preaching the, the Lamb of God and pointing out the fact from the Old Testament, the Messiah had to come. The Messiah was coming. The Messiah was this and the Messiah was that. It says he knew the scriptures. That is probably a nod to the fact that he probably had most of the Old Testament, if not all the Old Testament memorized. He could quote it. He could preach it, preach it. And it says that he was very charismatic. He was very, it says with great power, preach the word of God. Unlike Paul. Did you all know that Paul said, you know, people made fun of Paul's preaching. Even though we have Paul's books that we preach from. Paul said, oh, you know, even if my preaching is weak and y'all, you know, y'all say, oh, his letters are strong, but his preaching is not. Apollos was different. 
Matter of fact, Apollos was such a good preacher that remember the, the Corinthian church were like, hey, we follow Apollos. Y'all can follow Paul. And, and Apollos was not that guy. Though Apollos, uh, you can see in the book of Acts, said, hey, I'm not going back to Corinth right now. Because Paul tells him, he said, Apollos will come when he's ready. But right now he, he's not coming. Because Apollos didn't want none of that nonsense. I'm for Apollos. I'm for Paul. I'm for this. I'm for that. But Apollos was a, a mighty preacher. He knew the word of God. He knew up to, up to John, he knew that the Messiah was coming. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He knew what the Messiah was come to do, but that's it. He didn't know anything more than there. And, and something had to have been missing. Why? Because it says, even though he knew things accurately, even though he knew the scriptures, they came and taught him a more accurate thing, a more accurate way. You find Priscilla and Aquila who are both spoken of as apostles so ladies aquila is the male priscilla is the female both apostles co fellow co-workers with paul come on y'all should be more excited that means y'all can be leaders too amen in the church here we see in the book of acts in the in the bible there's women leaders amen yes i know it's a culture issue right now right not a biblical one it's right here in the text anyways who, who instructed him? Was it just Aquila? No, it was Priscilla too, wasn't it? So it was both of them. And in some texts, I think Priscilla is actually mentioned first, which is rare, right? Because you don't put the woman before the man in culture. But the Bible don't give a rip about that stuff. Amen? God said, I made man and women, and I like them. They're good. Amen? I know some people mad at that, but that's okay. That's what the Bible says. You can be mad at Jesus. So they're, they're sitting in church and they're listening to Apollos preach. Did you notice that? that how, they, they were listening to him. He was preaching. They went to church. Is that what Paul did? Yeah, he went to church. Now, most of the time Paul was preaching, but they went to church and they're sitting in church and they preach their ministers. They're, they're help plant, planting churches. They're fellow co-workers with Paul. But what are they? They're in church. And what do they hear? They hear this young man, Apollos, and he is preaching fire off the wall. Right? He's got people standing up and shouting and praising God and running circles and doing laps. I mean, if they had keys back then, he'd have keys going with them. I mean, he's going. He's getting it. And they're like, this is good, but you're missing something. Something's a little off. Something's a little wrong. Something's not totally correct. So what do they do? We're going to look at how they respond because I think that in their response, we're going to see how as leaders we can respond to the people around us who aren't perfect, who are learning, who are making mistakes, or who are not doing it exactly the right way. Amen? Because we need to learn how to build people up and not tear people down. And if we're going to lead well, no matter what sphere of, of the, the society we take, whether it be in your home or whether it be in a classroom, whether it be on a job, whether it be in a church, whether it be in a ministry, if we have to lead well, we have to lead differently. We have to lead in the form and format of Jesus. So let's look at this. Point, point number one, if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, listen to others. Listen to others. And I'm going to read verse 24 through 26 again. Just we'll read the beginning verses. It says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. He was a good speaker. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent. Boy, he was fired up. He was passionate. He was charismatic. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he didn't know everything. But what he knew, he knew well. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. So he's preaching in the church. And then when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. More accurately. So what did they do? They, the first thing they did was they listened to what he had to say. They were listening to him. They listened critically. Uh, with, and what, that, what I mean by that is if you look up the definition, one of the ways you understand critically is with, with um, careful judgment or judicial evaluation. In other words, I'm listening and I'm evaluating. I'm not attacking. I'm not criticizing. I'm evaluating. You know the difference, right? Or you, sh you should know the difference. They notice what he said. They notice how he said it. We actually have an idea of what he said and how he said it because he was mighty in the scriptures, right? And not only was he mighty in the scriptures, but he was fervent in spirit. 
So he was fired up and passionate about what he was learning about Jesus. He was fired up and passionate about the Bible. He was fired up and passionate about God's kingdom coming to earth, and he was letting everybody know. They identified that there was something good in him, didn't they? They, 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 they saw there was something in there, but they also identified, wait, something's wrong. Something's not right. He's, he's a little off here. So before we dig into this too much more, I just want to say the first thing we actually need to do is listen to people. We don't listen enough to people, uh, why people do what they do or, or what they're actually saying. And so we're ready to just attack and we're ready to jump in and we're ready to go after them before we even, re- we are even understand where they're coming from, before we even know where their starting point is. We need to hear what they're saying. We need to hear how they're saying. There is something that I like to use and it, it applies really good to discipleship, but it'll apply in every phase. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus it on discipleship and you can extrapolate it to your job or to, to your home or whatever you want. But, but here's the thing. When, when, when people talk, Uh, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when people talk, they reveal who they are. When, 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 I'll give you a good example. When people criticize or or when they complain, when when people complain, what are they doing? They're telling you what they think they should get and they're not getting. We take it as like, just shut up. You're, you know, don't attack me. Don't this. No, what they're telling you is I'm not getting something I want. When, when people get angry, why are they angry? Well, it may not be what, what, that, you know, what it looks like. It may be that they're mad at themselves for messing up. It may be that they're mad at, at, at themselves for, for not getting it right or not, not saying it right. And so their frustration comes out and looks one way, but, but we have to listen beyond that. This thing called phrase from the stage is, is very similar to what I would say spiritual growth or, or, or spiritual maturity, and it works naturally as well. But what, when, when babies are born, who takes care of babies? Parents do. Do, do. do babies know how to communicate? Do babies know how to do much anything other than make a mess and sleep and go to the bathroom? Right? They don't do much, do they? Matter of fact, the best, maybe the thing we can say about babies is, is that they, they, they make messes, right? We love babies, but babies make messes, don't they? Now, they bring new life, and they bring new energy, but they disrupt things. They make messes. Do you know that, that new Christians sometimes make messes? Do you know that new employees sometimes make messes? New hires, right? That new Marine, that new Airman, they make messes, don't they? You're like, bro, don't come in here like a bull in a china shop. Learn something before you do something, right? When people just start saying stuff, sometimes all they're doing is doing what, what they know to do, and that is make messes because maturely, developmentally, they're, they're still ch- babies. Then you have spiritual children. Uh, what, what's, what's the favorite word of, of young children? It's mine. That can't be the favorite word of young children. No, that's what they hear all the time. What is the word that they say all the time? Mine. When, when I have a Christian who is, who is child phase, maturity-wise, what does that sound like? Mine, my preference. It's, they're not playing my music. I'm not sitting in my seat. They don't have something for my age or the ministry doesn't fit me and the the songs were not for me and I didn't have a prophetic word for me and they just don't feed me and okay then you have then you have uh the next phase which would be kind of young adults teenagers what 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 are teenagers learning or what should they be learning to be responsible and they start, they start recognizing other people that it's not just about them. They start connecting with peers and building relationships. But they're just learning how to be responsible. They're learning how to function, you know, hopefully soon in adulthood. So, so, so teenagers, maybe spiritually we would say, someone in that, fa- in that phrase is looking for opportunities to serve. Looking for ways to make a difference. Looking for opportunities to use their gifts and their talents 
I want to serve. I want to give. I want to, I want to be in, in, I want to pray for people. I want to bless people. I want to make a difference with my life. And then you'd have, and I'm going to skip adults because I think that the young adults and the teenagers kind of fit in that same thing. Just the young adults are more, a little bit more advanced than that and go right to parents. What do parents do? God, but first thing they do is what? Make babies. I mean, that's how you become a parent, right? And then they guide. Then they teach and raise their kids. See, in the church, when it comes to leadership, one of the things we're lacking is spiritual parents. Paul said it like this. He said, y'all have many teachers, but few fathers in the faith. Few mothers. We just looked on Sunday at at the apostle Paul talking to the Thessalonians as a leader. And he said, I, I, I care for you like a nurturing mom. And then I came to you like a father who's concerned, right? What language is he using? Using that of a spiritual parent. So why am I bringing this up? Because when you're talking to people and you're listening to people and they're talking to you, the phrase from the stage, are they, are they saying things? It's all about me and mine. And I didn't get this. And I want this. Where are they? Well, mature wise, they're in that kid phase. If they're saying, how can I help you? Or or how do I find my purpose? And how do I get involved? And how do I, what phase are they in? The next phase, that teenage phase. If they don't even know enough to know anything, they're probably in that infant stage, aren't they? If they don't even care, which I didn't go into this one, they're probably spiritually dead, right? If you don't know Jesus, you're spiritually dead. So you don't know nothing about nothing and you don't even care. If, if you look at things from a, a mature leader's point of view or a mature parent uh, point of view, what are you trying to do? You're, 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 if I hear somebody who's saying, I'm pouring out my life into them, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting with them, I'm engaging with them, I'm imparting things to them, I know this person is a spiritual parent. They're, they're, they're at a maturity where they're actually helping people grow. They're developing people, guiding people, they're moving people. Why does that matter? Because if you don't know what stage someone is is at, you might talk to them wrong. You might expect, listen, we expect um, people to know a lot more than they actually do. And so we get mad at them when they don't live up to our expectation. Right? Like, like, let's say you've been on the job for a long time and somebody's been, like, like I'll just use the military for a minute. It, it, you know, you've had, uh, if you've been in the military, you've run into leaders, people who are in leadership positions, have leadership billets that have been in the Marine Corps for eight, 10 years. And they don't know nothing. And you're like, how is this possible? They've been in the environment, somehow they got promoted, but, and your expectation is you should know your job. But guess what? They don't know their job. And so you get frustrated. Because you're like, you're, you're presenting. It's kind of like saying, saying you're 30 years old. You should not be living in your mama's house, right? Because if you're 30 years old and you're living in your mama's house, there might be something wrong. Now, you could have gone through a crisis. There are moments where that's necessary. So no judgment on you. If that's the situation, you come into a financial hardship or there's a situation where you got to give care to your mother. I get that. That's, but, but normally, mature adults... Don't live in mama's house when they're past a certain point, right? And, and, and when we look at them, we say, something must be wrong. Something's not quite right. In the church and in, in our jobs and in the world, sometimes we, we, we have to stop and listen to find out where someone is so we can treat them in a way that will be honoring to who they are. Listen, if you're a spiritual baby, I am not going to throw high theological concepts at you and expect you to go out and do crazy stuff. I'm going to encourage you right where you are and try to help you become a spiritual child. If you're on the job and you're a new employee and you have no idea, you just got hired and you got thrown in this job and you don't know how to do it, I probably want to be patient with you and understand you don't know what you're doing. Now, if you say you've been on the job for a long time and you know what you're doing and you still do it wrong, now we got a problem. But how will I know unless I listen to you? Unless I listen for where you are. And this is what good leaders do. This is what they did. They listened for where he was. And see, when you listen to other people, you value them. You show that you're more interested in understanding where they are so that you can be in position to help them than you are about fixing them or getting them right. And that's really important. It's kind of like that that old quote, you know, people don't care how much you know until they what? Know how much you care. 
I, that might be John Maxwell too, to be honest with you. Throughout his ministry, Jesus regularly stopped and listened to the people that came to him in need. Like, like my favorite story of that is with the boy, that the father with the son that's demonized. You can write this down and go read this, but it's in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. Mark chapter 9, 14 through 29. Jesus is, is up on the, the Mount of Transfiguration. Let me set the scene. Right before this, he's up on the Mount of Transfiguration. God shows up. Y'all remember, Peter puts his foot in his mouth. And he's like, oh, you know, Jesus is talking to Elijah and Moses like, this is crazy. This is awesome. Let's build synagogue. Let's build a tent right here. We'll all preach and we'll have a great time. And then God's like, shut up. Listen to my son, right? You know, so Jesus comes down from the mount. He was just transformed. The Bible says he was transfigured. He was, he, he was white like lightning, just beautiful in holiness, so much so that nobody knew what to say. That was Peter's problem. He just, he didn't know what to say, so he just started talking, right? I feel that because I might resemble that a little bit. They come down the mountain and then, and then he rolls up on his other disciples and, and this guy in this big scene, there's a crowd and they're all talking amongst themselves and, and Jesus sees something's wrong because there's a boy flipping out on the ground and there's a man looking distraught and, he, and Jesus rolls up and says, what's going on here? And the man comes, he says, oh, if you can help me, please help me. Your disciples tried to pray for my son. He's got a demon and he's got a, he, he throws himself in the fire. He tries to drown himself. He's like, I had to quit my job. I had to, I have to care for him 24 seven because otherwise he's going to kill himself. It's ruining my, my life. I don't have any intimacy with my wife. Now I'm embellishing some facts there, but that's what, what you have to, to add to the whole thing because he had shifted his whole life to the care of this boy who was demonized. And he came to the disciples for help, and they couldn't help him. And so Jesus could have instantly just stopped the boy from spazzing, couldn't he? Right? Boys wiggling around on the ground. If you've ever seen a, someone demonized and see them do that, it is, it is, I call it snaky. It's scary. I was in Uganda, Africa, and we were doing uh, services there, and, and we had big prayer lines. And I'm telling you right now, I saw somebody pop. Just, I, it's not natural how they were moving on the ground. At the name of Jesus, though, they got free. But this boy is out here doing this while Jesus is standing here and the father's like crying and, and stressing out. And Jesus could have said, all right, everybody stop and just fixed it. But what do you do? He listened to this man and let the man, he asked the man, tell me about your life. Tell me about your story. Like, what's going on here? And then he showed compassion and delivered the boy. You got Martha with Lazarus. Her brother's dead. And Jesus could have easily just skipped to the, to the end and raised Lazarus from the tomb, couldn't you? But what does he do? He comes and talks to Martha. And Martha even's like, oh, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus is like, no, you're, your brother's going to live. And she's like, I know. He's like, do you believe this? She's like, yeah, I know. And in the end, he's going to live. And he said, no, he's going to live now because I'm the resurrection and the life. But what did he do? He listened to her. He let her talk about her pain. He let her talk about her sorrow. He didn't correct her. He didn't rebuke her. And he didn't skip to the point and fix the problem first. Guys, if we're going to be more effective at leading people and ministering to people, we've got to listen to people. That's what Jesus did. And then point number two, I've got to hurry up. Teach others. Teach others. So we got listen to others. And point number two, teach others. I'm just going to read verse 26 here. It says, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately, more accurately. Now, important part of leading people is to teach them how to succeed and prosper. To do it effectively, we have to do it with respect. We have to do it with care for the other person. In other words, we have to look at that person as a person with potential, someone creating the image and likeness of God who can actually accomplish things. Amen. If you look at somebody that you're supposed to lead as as a threat to your job or a threat to your authority or a threat to your credibility, will you teach them? No. Will you invest in them? Will you help them succeed? You won't do any of those things. But if you see them as someone that God has called them to be, uh, and you see them as someone that has gifts and talents, someone that's valuable, someone that has a purpose, you might change your mind, wouldn't you? I mean, part of the key is, just let me add this in, is that if you know who you are, you're not threatened by anybody else. But what did Aquila and Priscilla do? They, they pulled them aside and they talked with them. Did they call them out in public? Did they stand up in the middle of the sermon and say, whoa, ho, 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 Apollos. You fired up, but you were a little wrong. Did they go write a blog post about Apollo? 
Did they, did they criticize him on Twitter or X or social or anything? Threads, whatever the new thing is. Did they go out there and blast them? Put it on blast. They didn't do any of that stuff. They pulled him aside privately and they began to teach him. They said, hey, man, this is great. Boy, you know the word. Come on. You know John's teaching. Come on. But let me tell you a little bit more about life after the baptism of John. There's a baptism in, in the spirit. There's a baptism in Jesus where the kingdom comes to live inside of you. It's not just about my works anymore. Now it's about a relationship with God dwelling in me, leading me, guiding me, transforming me, something called an abundant life now in this life and in the next to come. Let me talk to you, Apollos. Let me tell you a little bit more about this beautiful thing called salvation, about the outworking and what, what's happened since, since Jesus showed up and John preached Jesus. Now, let's be honest. This requires patience, doesn't it? To teach somebody a more accurate way, right? I, I mean, I, I, I do computer things. I'm, I'm pretty smart with computers. I have, a, I think, a, just a gift from God for that. I can look at it and figure it out in pretty short order. And sometimes I forget how easy it is for me and how hard it is for other people. And to me, I'm like, it's just this and this and you're done. And they're like, eh, I don't know. And I'm like, oh, God. And I'm sitting there trying to tell them. It's like, ah. Is it? I'm like, I just showed you. You know, I have to be patient to teach. I have to be kind. Y'all laughing because you know how hard that is. Did you know that one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is patience? One of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is kindness? Listen, godly leaders concern themselves with equipping others. Their desire is to enable and empower others to know the truth and live by the truth so that they can mature and prosper and do the work they were created for. You know, I quote this often, so I'm not going to read it to you tonight, but if you go to Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 15, that whole pericope right there, you'll see that the purpose of godly leaders is to equip people, to help them grow into maturity, to teach them the truth so they know the difference between the false and the real, to help them prosper. And where every part comes together and every part does its share. That's a powerful thing. And that's what leaders should do. When you're on the job, what are you trying to do? You're trying to equip your coworkers so that they can succeed, so that together you can succeed as a department. Or as a company, you can succeed. That's, that's important. You want to enlist the partnership of someone so that they, together you can do what you're called to do. So if you're going to lead someone, teach them so they can do it good. Then maybe they won't frustrate you because they won't ask you any questions. They'll know how to do it. Amen? Now, we have to tell, the peop tell people the truth in love. So we do tell the truth, but how do we do it? In love. Amen? So we have to be patient with them in our tone and patient with them in our approach. To be gentle with them. We have to encourage them. Let me, let me finish this point with one side note. Apollos was teachable, wasn't he? So if we want to, to be effective in our own life and ministry, one of the qualities we need to have is to be teachable. He already could preach. He already knew the word. But what else, what else did he have? He could learn. He could grow. He didn't think he was all that in a bag of chips. And the number one reason why so many people get stopped, why you don't get promoted or why you don't, God doesn't use you more or, or these is because we're not teachable. We get to a point where we think we got it and we know it. And, and here's the thing, real leaders, they keep growing because the, the, the wiser you are, the more you realize you don't know, right? Haven't y'all discovered that the older you get, the more you're like, oh man, I do not know how the world works. Isn't it fun when you have teenagers and they tell you how the world works? If you don't have teenagers yet, you'll find out. They think they know. And they are dead serious that they know. And they're dead wrong too. You know, the older you get, the more you realize, well, I, I you know, I have a hand. I saw a joke where someone said, if, how, if we only use 10% of our brain, how do we know we only use 10% of our brain? <laughs> Food for thought. All right, let's finish up with point number three. We want to encourage others. So verse 27 through 28, it says, and, he, and when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. 
And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So again, the goal of leaders is to equip people to function in their calling, to function in their purpose, to operate within their talent, skills, and abilities in the job that they have before them. And this can come in the form of verbal praise. I want to encourage you, you're doing a great job, right? We, we often use that for reviews. We often use that as incentives, you know, for, for uh, future promotion or for future pay raises, right? You want to encourage people and what they're doing well, but it also comes through open doors. How did, how did uh, Priscilla and Aquila and even the church there that they were a part of, how did they encourage Apollos? They actually told other people that he's the real deal. Open the door for him. They opened doors for him. They wrote a letter. They sent ahead and said, hey, let him in based on our relationship. Let this guy in. So what they do, they made a way for this guy to function in his gift. They weren't threatened by it. They weren't like, oh no, only I can preach. They said, no, he can do it. I'm going to open the door for him. I wonder how many more uh, things could we accomplish together if we would open doors for each other? If we would encourage one another, you know, that's good. Keep that up. That's excellent. Keep that up. You're doing a great job. And even if it's not the way you would do it, it doesn't matter. Amen? Because sometimes, you know, when a person takes over a job, this has been true, that sometimes when you're training someone to take over your job, they may start at like 40% of your capacity, but you don't know what their ceiling is. They may actually end up doing it better than you. Amen? I'm just telling you, that's the way it works. Sometimes we're like, oh man, you stink when you get started. Oh, we all did. We were babies. We made messes. We didn't know. But we learned and we grew and now we can do it well. Amen? So we're not God and we don't know the limits that are on the people that God has called us to serve. So what should we do? We should encourage them to press their limits, to lean into their purpose and equip them and empower them and enable them, provide them opportunities, open doors. This is an important part of leading others in the way of Jesus. Jesus made disciples and he led them in a process of apprenticeship. And this model, you've probably heard it before, but it's the I do, we do, you do model. You ever heard that? I do, we do, you do. What did that look like? Well, Jesus would demonstrate and then explain, right? He would do something and he would teach them what he did. He would pray for somebody and then tell them, well, this, this only comes out through prayer and fasting. So what do y'all got to do? You got to pray and fast. And so then he said, hey, uh, and now we're going to do that. So he would send it, he would take the disciples out with him and say, y'all come with me. And they would, they would do something. He said, I want you to feed the 5,000. We're going to pray together and then you're going to do the work. And in their hands, they got to see the bread multiply, right? And then what did he do? He said, all right, now it's your turn. And he sent them out two by two, first the 70, then, then the 120, later on 500, right? So what did he do? He showed them and taught them first. He was there with them while they did it, kind of supervising, and then he turned them loose. Why? He created space for me. He taught them. He encouraged them and said, I believe in you. Go do it. And then remember, they came back. The 70 came back and they were rejoicing that even demons were subject to to his name. And he said, listen, don't rejoice about that. That's no big deal. Rejoice that your names are written in the book of life, right? That you're saved and going to heaven. And then what did he do? After he he did it, he showed them how to do it. And then they did it. And then they, they went and did it on their own. Then he said, okay, now you repeat this process with other people. That's called make disciples. So what is the goal? The goal is to multiply and increase in and through other people. It's to empower our protégés to be competent and capable to do the work themselves. It's to open the door for them to practice and give them opportunities to perform in their gifts, to use their talents, their abilities. It wasn't just the leader's job to do it. It was the leader's job to teach others so that they could do it themselves. And then they could teach other people because they knew how to do it. That was Jesus' way. Matter of fact, you can see that in Acts 1.1. It says, uh, 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 Luke says, hey, Theophilus, I, I want to continue my account. Because y'all know Book of Acts is part two, right? Luke, book, Luke, uh, uh, Luke's gospel is part one. Part two is, is the Book of Acts. And what does Luke start off with saying? I, I, you heard already, I'm going to continue the account of all Jesus began to both do and to teach. He taught them and did things. And then he sent them out to go do the same thing. The whole book of Acts is what? Them doing the things Jesus taught them to do. If you want to be a good leader, if I want to be a good leader, it's not about what I can do or what you can do. It's about what we can help other people do. 
Because if I can help you do it, then guess what? You can do more. Together, we can do more than if it's just me. The world's looking for and expecting for a better way of leadership. Not selfish, not cutthroat, not immoral, not unrighteous. They want something different, something better. And Jesus teaches us a better way. So we can learn to apply these simple principles. I mean, this is simple. Listen to people. Teach people who don't know. Instead of judging them and criticizing them, say, you knucklehead, you're stupid. Why can't you figure this out? Say, let me show you. And let me, let me be patient and kind with you, which is hard. Ask my wife. Sometimes my tone is not as kind. I got to check myself. Holy Spirit be like, shut up. Talk to my daughter that way. I'm, I, I don't, I'm not saying I got this perfect, but this is the way. This is the better way. This is what we got to do. We got to listen. We got to teach. And then we got to encourage. You got to make space. You got to say, listen, you know what? I know you're just getting started, but don't worry. You can do this. I love Patton's model of leadership. Did you know what Patton did? Patton rolled up on the army when the army was terrible. And, and he said, this y'all the worst unit ever in the history of the army. That's what people say. But that's not what I believe. I believe you can be the strongest fighting force the world's ever seen. I believe that if you'll follow me, if you'll listen to me, if you'll do your part, if you'll step in and step up, then we will, we will accomplish every mission. We will tear down every, every enemy and we will fight for democracy and freedom around the world. And guess what happened? They lived up to his expectation. Why? Because he believed in them. He, he encouraged them and then he turned them loose. What if we did that? What if we did that in the church? What if we did that in our homes? What if we did that on the job? What if we did that? Well, I believe if we did that, then we would lead people in a more accurate way according to truth and into a better life. I believe that we'll be different in that we won't use people, we'll honor people. We won't treat people like subjects or objects or tools to serve us, but we will serve them and empower them so that they can fulfill their calling in God and they can find their place in the kingdom. If we do this, then I believe we'll actually be taking steps to make disciples the more accurate way. Amen? So I know that it's time to wrap it up. But I, I, want, you to, I want you to take to heart some of these things. Because God has positioned you where you are to make a difference. And even if you're not the point leader, even if you're not the main leader, even if you think, I, I don't have any say, that's not true. If you have any bit of influence, then you have leadership capacity. We lead up. You can influence bosses and higher-ups. We lead Horizontally, we can lead our peers. We can influence our peers. And we lead down. There are people that are counting on us, that are learning from us. And if we listen to them, if we teach them, and if we encourage them, then together we can do great things. So let's lead in a more accurate way. God's way. The best way. And let's make a difference. Amen? I want to ask you to pray with me. Live stream family, pray with me right now. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God to help us in our leadership. So Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us lead and live even a more accurate way. Lord, I know that we're doing good things and I know that there's lots that is right, but Lord, there's more that we could do that's better, more that we could do that's consistent with your word, more that we can do that's consistent with your character, with your nature. And so Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and you would help us to see that in ourselves so that we can pour that out in others. Lord, I pray that we would be more effective listeners. Lord, I pray that we would be better teachers. Lord, I pray that you'd give us the patience and the kindness and the fruit of the Spirit that we need in order to do that effectively. And then, Father, I pray that we would be like Barnabas, sons of encouragement, daughters of encouragement, that we would encourage people, that we would open doors for people, that we would make a way so that, Lord, their success would be our success as well. So that whatever they accomplish, they would have to say that because of us, we helped them, we opened the door for them, we taught them something, we encouraged them, we blessed them, we did something that they'll look back to us. Not like I did with my chemistry teacher, but like I might look back at some of my other teachers who made a significant difference in my life or successful leaders who taught me the way I should go. Lord, let us be able to look back, let, let us be able to, at the end of our days, 
be the one that people look back to and say, they showed me a more accurate way. And because of that, people's lives were changed. In Jesus' name, amen.